You can open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 1 through 12 tonight. 1 John chapter 5, 1 through 12, that's in page 1023 on your pew Bibles. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We'll begin by reading the verses together. This is God's Word. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has, that he has born concerning his Son, Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Well, maybe you're like me and you despaired a couple years ago when Oxford Dictionary announced that the word of the year was the selfie. If you're not familiar with the selfie, it's uh, taking a vanity photo with your smartphone, um, something that has taken our society by storm, a series of unimaginative and un, uh, uncreative uh, photos that have filled our Facebook timelines and filled our galleries with pictures of ourselves. But the good news is, it turns out, unimaginative photos of ourselves predate the selfie. Um, I, I'm just going to submit one line of evidence for this, and it's called holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's a picture of a tourist who goes to the uh, attraction, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and they position themselves so it looks as if they are holding up the tower with their hands, and they snap a picture. Um, Google it if you dare, it's a little depressing, but at one point I found a wide-angle lens photo with no less than a dozen people taking their very own photos in that pose at the same time. And it, it just made me think, wow, I mean, we're, we're not very creative, I guess, but lack of artistic ability in our photographs aside, it got me thinking, what is it that's so captivating about this tower? I mean, obviously it leans, but is it really that big of a deal? Well, it may interest you to know that as of right now, it's leaning about 3.9 degrees. That's a pretty significant lean. But at some point, it was actually worse than that. It was about 5.5 degrees of a lean. Um, and it's been leaning in some form or the other for about 700 years. I think why it's such an attraction, something that captivates our imagination, is because we're secretly hoping that one day it's going to fall over. <laughs> but the truth is, it won't fall over. Uh, years ago, they undertook a renovation project to correct some of the lean and to shore up the foundation. See, that was the problem all along. It was built in soft clay that was not able to support the structure. And it was only had a foundation that was about three meters deep. And so, without fail, it began to lean. But through the marvels of modern uh, engineering, the tower is now structurally sound. And I'm told that we are all likely to topple over before the tower will. I think that there's a lot that can be drawn by analogy from the Leaning Tower of Pisa to our experience in the Christian life. 
as Christians, we know that there are these things that we should live up to. There are these weighty expectations. We are to act like Jesus. We are to grow in godliness. We are to love each other. We are to stand firm in in the face of opposition. And when we see those things done well, it's as if there is a beautiful, upright, shining tower that all of us can see as well as the world around us. You, You can think of people in your own life that do this well, and you can think about how they are your role models. They're people you look up to, people you notice. Yet there's also times in the Christian life where we don't feel like we're standing upright, where faith isn't coming easily, and in fact, we feel the lean beginning to set in. And it's at those moments we need to ask ourselves, what are we going to do, or where can we turn to ensure our lean doesn't turn into a topple? Is there any way that we can support the weight of expectations placed on us as on believers? And if so, what is it? Well, tonight we're going to look in this passage in 1 John. And as we do so, we're going to see the weighty expectations for Christians in the first five verses. And then in verses 6 through 12, we're going to see the foundation that's able to support them. The big idea that we're going to get to is that the Christian life rests upon the foundation of what God has shown us about Jesus. The Christian life rests upon the foundation of what God has shown us about Jesus. And without that foundation, it's simply impossible. First, let's look at the weighty structure of the Christian life. Or to put it in the terms of our series, you could say, what it looks like to have True faith, love, and life. What a Christian looks like in verses 1 through 5. Now remember, as we've been studying this book of 1 John, um, John is writing to a church of of believing Christians that he loves very dearly. But it's also a church that has had uh, its share of wounds recently. They've had a series of false teachers that have left the church. And not only have they left the church, they've tried to drag others with them out. So John is writing both to encourage these Christians to stay true to the message they've heard from the beginning, but he's also writing to them to point out the errors of these false teachers. And as he's done this, he's written in this rather circular or roundabout style with these themes coming in and out of focus time and time again as he makes his points. And tonight is no different. Uh, I may wish that I could ask the Apostle John to speak a little more clearly if I had the chance. But what he's driving at actually isn't that difficult to get across. John's going to show us in these three sections we're going to look at of these first five verses that this is what the Christian life looks like. And these are three themes that we've already seen as we've been studying this book. If we imagine the analogy of a tower, you could think of them as each one floor on the tower built right on top of each other, pushing the next one down and bearing the weight above it. The first is that of family love. Now, love has been a very very prominent theme throughout this book. If you were here last week when uh, Jesse preached from chapter 4, We saw that the love that Christians have for each other is actually a divine love. It's a love that comes from the love that we experience from God himself. And that the outflow of that love is that we in turn turn around and love each other. Well, here John takes that theme of love and focuses it a little more to specifically how siblings love each other. He starts off by telling us that everyone that believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. That's a familial term, that you're God's child. And then he says, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. To put it simply, John is saying that Christians are people that love other Christians. It seems basic. It goes all the way back to the apostolic era, but a sure mark of what a Christian is, is someone that loves other Christians. Now, let's recognize that this is not saying it's easy to love other Christians, or that it'll always come naturally, or it's something that we'll always find joyful. But it is something that is true of us. We will labor with each other to love each other. 
We will pass over grievances. We will forgive each other. Ultimately, Christians will be known as people that love each other. It's not an easy task. It's not a task that makes a lot of sense from society's point of view. People come into, into the life of a church and uh, they, they don't really have a lot of reason by societal or, or socioeconomic uh, reasons to hang out together or to love each other. Yet in the church, we find these people united by a common father. They've been born of God. They're in the same family. They are siblings. Well, that first floor is weighty enough. Already, maybe you're starting to feel a little bit of the weight on your shoulders, how difficult that is. But the second floor doesn't help things much. Uh, This is verses 2 and 3. And here we're talking about a heart for obedience. Now, John has drawn out again this theme of obedience throughout his letter. Back in chapter 2, he made a really big point of saying that one of the ways you can tell the false teachers from genuine Christians is the false teachers don't think that they need to obey commandments. They think they can live however they want. It's a matter of spirituality. Uh, It doesn't really matter about holiness or about uh, following the way God wants us to live. Yet here John tells us that we as Christians will be people that will want to obey. We will find God's commandments not burdensome. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to find them easy. It doesn't mean they're going to come naturally. They are definitely weighty. But it does mean that at some level, we will want to please God. We will want to please our Father and to live in a way that's pleasing to Him. And that means we are going to do the things he tells us to do, and we're going to avoid the things he tells us to avoid. Christians are those people who obey, but the key is that they obey from the heart. It's not mere duty, although duty is present. It is the very pattern of a Christian's life to obey. You can feel the weight of the two floors together now pressing down on us, but there's still the last floor, the penthouse, if you will, which is the heaviest yet. This is in verse 4. It's the backbone of faith. The third way you can spot a Christian is the backbone of faith. John says that for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Now, earlier in the letter, he has mentioned this overcoming and perseverance theme. Uh, Back in chapter 2, he spoke about how real Christians, as opposed to the false teachers, are those who stick it out. They they stay in the church, even when things are tough. In chapter 4, he described Christians at different levels of maturity and described them as those who have overcome the evil one. Well, here he talks again, and he blanketly says, if you're a Christian, it means you overcome the world. Now, how is it that we can be said to overcome? Well, this isn't saying that Christians are people with iron wills, that we, nothing could possibly shake our faith, that we're just so disciplined that no one can ever trick us or lead us into temptation or anything like that. What this is saying, though, is that even in the face of false teaching and temptation, ultimately Christians are going to stay with Jesus. John makes that clear by saying that what is the the victory that we have? Um, It is our faith. That is that the way that a Christian wins is by staying with Jesus till the end. Now, if you take all three of those markers and you put them together, they are weighty. They are heavy. But I submit to you that if you think about the people who you admire most as Uh, models for the Christian life, you will see all three of these attributes present without fail. Just to give you a couple of examples, people that are tied here to our Wheaton community, uh, you can think of Billy Graham, and you can uh, think about, uh, I just forgot her name for a second, Uh, I'm thinking of the wife of one of the missionaries that died in Ecuador, Uh, Elizabeth Elliot, there we go, thank you. Both of those people stayed true to the end with Jesus. Both of them showed a love for God's people. And both of them showed a desire to obey from the heart. Now, what's the problem with that, though? I don't know about you, but I'm no Billy Graham, as obvious from 
forgetting my, who I was talking about there. Um, and I, my guess is neither are you, and you're probably not an Elizabeth Elliot either. So where can we, people in the pew, the people of God, who maybe feel more like we're leaning than standing straight and tall, where can we turn to when it doesn't feel like we have true faith, love, and life? How is it that we can stay straight and true under the weight of these expectations? Well, I think John intends for us to ask that question because he devotes the next seven verses to answering it by showing us the foundation that we are standing on. So the first section, we're, we're looking at what it looks like to be a Christian. The second section, we're looking at where the faith of the Christian life originates, where it's, what sustains us. I've told you about a poorly constructed tower in Italy and how that has not gone well in terms of it staying upright. But there's another building that is far more successful on this front. It's called the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It opened in 2010, and it stands a measly 2,722 feet tall. It weighs approximately 450,000 tons. The weight and height of this structure was so great, it is the tallest building in the world, by the way, um, that they had to invent a new way of a honeycomb-style support structure on the inside of it to keep it from swaying in the wind. Now, for a big, heavy building like that, you need a big, heavy, strong foundation. So what went into making this foundation? I decided I was going to look it up. And it is quite impressive. Unlike the uh, three meters deep uh, original foundation of the Leading Tower of Pisa, the, uh, the Burj Khalifa has a foundation that measures 58,900 cubic yards. It has a total of 110,000 tons worth of concrete at its base. They knew that getting the foundation right was key to this building standing, so they actually brought in a special team to test out a new blend of concrete specially designed to withstand the force of this gigantic weight of the, this building. The, the uh, particular conditions in Dubai were so hot that they had to pour the entire foundation at night, and then it was still too hot, and so they actually had to mix ice into the concrete in order to get it to cure properly. But the result is one of the modern marvels of our world. The tallest building in the world, gleaming in the Dubai sun, standing straight and true. If you're going to build a build, big building, you need a big foundation. And to, in order to stand up under the weight of expectations of the Christian life, you need a sure foundation. John tells us the place we can find this is by seeing the testimony God has given us about Jesus. The foundation necessary for us as believers to be able to stand up under the weight of the expectations is what God has told us about Jesus. John, that's basically what he's going to be saying for the next seven verses. What he said, God has told us about Jesus is how the Christian life is possible, and without it, it's impossible. I'd say that very clearly on the front end because these verses are admittedly not all that clear. Uh, it's always a good sign when you read a commentary and th they describe the section you're preaching on as, quote, the most perplexing parts of the letter. And looking down, you can see why. Um, he says in verse 6, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth clear as mud, right? Um, obviously n not simple verses, but I think what he, John's getting at is something that we can fairly easily grasp. Now, there have been lots of theories about what he's said throughout the years. Uh, some people think that the water and the blood are referring to the amniotic fluid and the blood that came out when Jesus entered the world through way of the Virgin Mary at his birth. Uh, I don't think that's what he's talking about. Uh, other people think that he's talking about uh, the, the ordinances of the church, of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But if we keep in mind that what he's saying is God has told us who Jesus is and revealed that truly to us, 
And I think what he's saying comes into clear focus. The water makes perfect sense to be referring to Jesus' baptism. If you remember back into the Gospels, when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, he, he comes out from the water, the Spirit descends upon him, and then he hears a voice from heaven. It says, this is my beloved Son, of whom I am well pleased. That sounds to me like God telling us who Jesus is. The blood then would be the reference to his death on the cross. And God's testifying to who Jesus is by all the events that happened right after that. The darkening of the skies. The rending of the temple veil from top to bottom. The resurrection from the dead three days later. All these things are God clearly saying, Jesus is the one who I've sent. My salvation will be found in him. The Spirit, similarly, has a historical reference in view here. It's the ongoing of Jesus after his ascension, after, as he continues his ministry among his disciples through the Spirit's presence. You see that at Pentecost and beyond. The Spirit testifies inside to believers, and the Spirit enables them to proclaim the message out to all the nations. So John's roundabout way of getting at this point is all building to the head of saying, God actually told us who Jesus is. We can know it because God has made it clear to us. Now, let's be clear about something. Someone testifying about an event or a person is only as good as that person's credibility. You see this in court cases all the time. If you don't like what someone's saying on the stand, you try and undermine their credibility so that their testimony will be seen as invalid. John here is telling us that the reason we can have this faith, love, and life is because God himself has spoken to us about Jesus. It doesn't rest on our iron wills. It doesn't rest on our ability to obey perfectly. It rests on whether or not God has spoken and whether we can know it. Now let's just pause here for a moment and recognize that one of the biggest hurdles to, coming to, be, to becoming a Christian is to believe that Christianity is something more than just a set of rules, a moral value system. The, one of the most common misunderstandings I find in my conversations with unbelievers is that uh, they think that Christianity is about moral improvement, uh, about spirituality, and about becoming uh, someone that is better and better at following what the Bible says. Now, it's certainly true, as we just saw in the first five verses, that becoming a Christian will change the way you live. But fundamentally, the Christian life is not about a value system. It's not about morals. It's not about keeping rules. It's about hearing news. We say we're people who have believed the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus. Just as surely as you turn on the television and you hear a news report and you find it credible and so you put trust in the information you're receiving, we as Christians are people who have heard what God has said and have believed his testimony to be true. And thus it has changed us. I heard on the radio recently uh, a non-Christian who was trying to be charitable and trying to defend uh, a Christian who was in the crosshairs in the public eye. And, but the way he did it was very telling. He said uh, that this one person was criticizing this Christian, and so he came in and he said, whoa, 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 whoa. You cannot criticize someone for a belief they hold. You can't test religion based on history and science. You just can't do it. Now, while I appreciate him trying to leave room for there to be belief in our society, Realize that, that that sort of relativized squishiness just doesn't square with what John is saying here. John is saying that God has put all of his chips on the table and pushed them forward, that Jesus is really who he said he is. John goes so far to say that if anyone who denies what God has said about Jesus is making God out to be a liar, God's reputation is actually on the line. 
it does us no good to push back and try to avoid conflict and pretend as if we can say, well, we really can't know what God says anyway. The claim of Scripture and the claim of 1 John is that God has spoken to us and revealed clearly enough for us to believe that Jesus is the one that we have been waiting for. He is the one we need to trust in, and he is the only one who can bring us salvation. Now, I think as believers, this means that we have an obligation to be ready to engage at least at some level at some basic apologetics when it comes to what God has said about Jesus. Uh, Every Christmas, there is a slew of uh, television programs and magazine articles and things that are going to come out that are seeking to cast doubt on whether we really know what happened 2,000 years ago or whether it's possible for us to actually, with any sort of intellectual credibility, believe that Jesus was a real person who really was the Son of God. Now, your tendency may be to not engage in those things, and and maybe that's fine. But I think that if we're going to take this seriously, at some point, we need to make sure our foundation is strong. I don't think this means you need to get a degree from across the street. Uh, I don't think it means you need to pull out from your job and spend a, a season focusing on intense study. But I do think you need to familiarize yourself with some of the very common and basic objections you will get as a Christian who believes that Jesus really did live 2,000 years ago and really did go on to a cross to die for your sins. Now, if that's the case, if you've never done that sort of study, let me just recommend a couple of entry-level books that can get you acquainted with some of the, the issues involved in the topics as well as encouraging your own faith by understanding some of the real, really good reasons we have to believe. Uh, one's a, a bestseller that's been out for a long time. It's called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It's got a, a, each chapter is written by a different uh, Christian scholar, and they, uh, they have a, there's a lot of just really good, accessible information in there that will be very helpful to you, that I think will really help you to have some confidence in the historical reliability of what God has told us about Jesus. There's another one which we have in our book stall, Uh, which I read recently from uh, author Kevin DeYoung called Taking God at His Word. Uh, That one's focusing specifically on the issue of Scripture. And can you really believe what Scripture says? How how do we get the Scriptures? How is that reliable? Um, Let me just recommend both of those books to you as things that can help to prepare you for those conversations, but also things that will shore up your own foundation give you confidence in what God has said about Jesus so that you can stand firm. But even as good as those books are, we would be remiss if we didn't focus on the main way that we hear God's testimony about Jesus. And that's by reading the scriptures he's given us. If we are not reading about the life of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels, if we're not reading about the letters that the apostles who serve him wrote, if we're not reading the Old Testament that prophesies about him, then how could we expect our faith to grow if it is the very foundation which holds it up? Brothers and sisters, if this is true, what John is saying, that the testimony of God about Jesus is the key to the Christian life being sustainable, that having this true life, love, and uh, life, love, and faith, then if this is true, then we need to be people that are reading what God has said to us. What happens, though, when we don't do this? What what happens when someone loses that foundation, when they lose their belief that God has spoken about Jesus? What happens to somebody who no longer can say that God has spoken Well, there's someone in the public eye who this happened to. Um, He was a a New Testament scholar that many people would know, ran in many of the circles that we have here in Wheaton. Um, But along the way, in one of his lectures, he talks about how he became convinced that there were errors in the New Testament. And eventually, it led to him believing that this could not be actually God speaking. That the Bible was not trustworthy. And so therefore... If God hasn't spoken, then either he's incapable of speaking or he doesn't care. And very shortly after coming to that conclusion, he left the faith. 
And now he has a cottage industry actually writing books, trying to convince others to follow him. That's a tragic story. Uh, and he's not the only one, he's just a very public example of it. Uh, I know someone personally who was in the church, much like this one, who led worship, who went out on evangelism uh, sorties, and uh, who over time began to doubt whether or not they could trust what the Bible said and whether God really spoke in a way that we could understand. And over time, they, they kept insisting that even though that their beliefs about Scripture and w what we could know about Jesus had changed, that they were still going to live as a Christian. But over the years that have gone by, I've seen the love for evangelism fall off. I've seen the love for his church fall off. And lately, I've even seen very faith fall off. Brothers and sisters, without the foundation of God actually speaking to us, the Christian life is simply not possible. But the good news is that for those of us who do believe, that for those of us who not only have accepted what God has said about Jesus, but have that confirmed within us by his spirit, who have put our trust in Jesus alone as our Savior and are seeking to walk according to what he shows us of life, the good news is for us, John tells us in verse 11, that this testimony that God gave us is eternal life. That this foundation is so sure that even though for a time it may seem as if we are leaning, even though it may seem weighty and too difficult, that ultimately we have now and will have forever true life because we are in Jesus. It's not ultimately based on us and our ability to perform. It's something that has been done to us and a reality that's true of us. The Christian life is a difficult thing to live. That spire that we can look up and see, we can spot so easily, it is something that we just can't do on our own strength. But when that foundation is laid firmly in what God showed us about Jesus, then that, that tower, even though it may seem like it's leaning, it will stand straight and true. I'll close with a story that I heard from someone in our church. They had the opportunity to go out and hear uh, about a new ministry that a family was undertaking. And this family has been a remarkably consistent Christian family over the years. They have sought to use their business in a way that's pleasing to God. They have given sacrificially and consistently to the church and to missions. They've even withstood uh, personal attacks and uh, various other difficulties in their life. And they've stayed faithful through all of it. And this particular ministry that they were beginning to, they were pitching to explaining what they're going to do, uh, was a particularly costly and risky one. Uh, it was, the idea was to bring the Bible to people that are particularly hard to reach in our society in a way that was uniquely available to them, that was going to cost them a ton of money. During the course of this talk about this ministry, uh, they got asked a question of, how is it that you've been able to do all this? How is it you guys have been able to give so sacrificially, to live so consistently? How have you been able to handle all this? And uh, the husband of the family thought about it for a second, and he said, you know, many years ago, we came to the conclusion that this stuff is real. And since then, everything else has just kind of made sense. Brothers and sisters, I'm not thinking that we're going to walk out and each of us are going to be Billy Graham. But I do think that we can believe that God has spoken to us about Jesus. And if he's revealed who Jesus is and what that means for us, we can have true love, life, and faith. We can stand up straight and true in whatever corner of the world God's put us in. And we can do so without worry that one day, we will topple over and fall. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we confess that our hope can be built on nothing less. 
in your blood and your righteousness. Would you work in us so that we would believe what the Father has told us about you? Would you make it sure in our hearts? Would you give us confidence and make our foundation so strong that the weight of expectation for the whole life you've called us to is not impossible, but is in fact inevitable. Thank you, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen.